<clears throat> Hi, my name is Erica Newland, and I'm going to talk today about interactive graphics with D3 and React. D3 is a powerful JavaScript library for rendering data-driven interactive graphics in the DOM. Its main functionality comes from its select and uh, method chaining patterns. D3.select and D3.selectAll select DOM elements and return plain JavaScript objects that are references to those elements. This is particularly powerful because then we can chain other D3 and regular JavaScript functions off of that return value. We can then append and modify DOM elements as a result. One of the most powerful aspects of D3 is its ability to bind data directly to DOM elements in its data method. So you can see here in the data method, we are binding a data array, and each element of the array is mapped over and matched to a DOM element. So the first DOM element, which is the red circle, is then given the data element of 30 as an attribute. In addition, D3 has what's called an enter, update, exit pattern. In the enter set of data, D3 recognizes DOM elements <coughs> that do not yet exist, but for which there are data elements. And it creates an enter set. And you can then use that enter set to actually append the needed DOM elements to the DOM. Similarly, when data is updated and data points are removed, D3 creates an exit set and will remove the excess DOM elements from the DOM. In addition, D3 keeps track of the data appended to the DOM and will create an update set as data updates and will re-render those pieces of the DOM that need re-rendering. D3 and React are both very powerful technologies for rendering single page interactive applications. But they don't always play well together because they both want to paint the DOM. React paints the DOM through its virtual DOM, and D3 manipulates the DOM directly. So if D3 is ma manipulating the DOM directly, and React is trying to use a virtual representation of that DOM, React will lose track of it and throw strange errors. There are a number of approaches for integrating D3 with React. And what we're going to focus on today is forcing React to hand over a portion of it, the DOM for D3 to manipulate. A good use case of this is when you have highly interactive, highly customized applications that you want to render in a React component. So to provide you an example, I've created a world map that renders maternal mortality rates relative to the country. And we want to provide some interaction so that when we click the map, the data updates and therefore the map updates. And it's a little bit hard to see because it updates slowly and we have some outliers which make the color similar. But if you watch India, you can see that with the click, the data is updating and it's causing the colors to re-render with the updated colors. So let's look at how we do this. <coughs> One of the <coughs> criticisms of forcing React to hand over DOM elements is that the components that you create aren't highly reusable. So to get around that, I created a map container component. And this is where I'm going to be doing a lot of my data preparation, and also where I'm going to be creating methods to pass in. So here, in, the world, uh, in my container, I'm rendering my world map component, and I'm passing in my data. And this component really is just manipulating my data to get it into an array of objects that contain both the geographic data and the World Health Organization data. I'm providing a width and height for my canvas, and that means that I have ultimate reusability because that's being provided on the outside of my world map container. And I'm also sending in my onclick function, which just reruns my data joining functions with updated data for the next year. So in my actual world map component, the only thing that D3 is doing is rendering this SVG canvas, or scalable vector graphic canvas. And we're providing the width and the height that we passed in. And then we use this ref attribute. And the ref attribute is something that React provides. 
and it allows you to have access to the underlying DOM, the actual DOM, rather than the virtual DOM, where the element is being rendered. And then we have our on-click functionality that we passed in. Another really important thing to note here is that in order to get React to hand over control of the component, we have to set should component update to return false always. We never want React to re-render this element. We want it to render the canvas once and then leave it alone for D3 to manage. So in component will receive props, that's where my new data is going to come in, whether it's from the on-click or my initial data. And inside of that, I'm going to call my own render function, which I called render map, which is where all of my D3 functionality takes place. So the top of my render map function. Um, here I have access directly to my node. So if you remember in the ref, we saw set this.node to the node that we were rendering this canvas inside of. So that's what our node reference is. Now we're going to set width and height directly to the actual node width and height so that we're manipulating the DOM directly. And we're going to grab that map data. D3 has a very powerful suite of data manipulation and um, analysis tools that we can use. And I've just used a few here to show you as an example. Projection takes our lat long data and maps it to an XY reference so that we can actually render geographic data in a flat um, screen, like our computer screen. D3 has a lot of really powerful scaling functions that I find really interesting. And um, the simplest of that is scale linear. But all of its scale functions allow you to provide a maximum and minimum of your data, and then map that to a maximum and minimum of some other data. In this case, I'm just feeding in a low color value and a high color value, and it maps all of the data in between and interpolates between them. So here, I'm selecting my node, and I'm going to append a G element to that node. And then I take that G element, and I select all path elements. I don't actually have any path elements in my DOM right now. That's what creates my enter set. When I try to append to non-existent path elements a set of data, I get an enter set because now I have a set of elements for which data exists, but no actual DOM elements exist. So I can then take my enter elements, or my enter set, and append actual path elements to it, and then manipulate them by providing attributes. The two most important of those attributes is my D attribute. That tells D3 how to draw the line to outline my country. And my fill attribute, which pulls that scale and fills in the color based on the World Health Organization data that exists in my data object. When on click is called, new data comes in through my props. And that's where my merge functionality comes in. Rather than having a new enter set, I now have an update set. And merge maps the data in the DOM currently to the data in the DOM coming in, re-renders those pieces of data that need to be re-rendered, and updates accordingly. And then I am removing any unnecessary DOM elements with my exit. In this case, that's actually not useful. But if I were to render this <coughs> component in a different set in a different setting where data was being removed and I need to remove DOM elements, I would use that there. So when we actually render interaction, given the type of component that we used, we have a number of different um, approaches that are available to us. And the approach that you saw was that we sent in required data and function as props. And so that was really useful because then we had a highly reusable component. So in conclusion, data, um, displaying data in an interactive, highly customized way is really powerful and very useful across a wide set of industries. But you want to be careful when you render data to not overanalyze and over-render it or we get something that looks like this. <laughs> Thank you.